primum uh, with the primum atrial septal defect, a common atrioventricular valve, and then a, a large inlet septal defect. There's also intermediate and transitional forms, uh, which have varying degrees of a sept, uh, ventricular septal defect and an atrial septal defect, as well as varying degrees of septation of the atrioventricular valves. On the far right, you have a partial AV canal, which includes mostly just an um, atrial septal defect with incomplete septation of the atrioventricular valves. There are two different valves, but the left AV valve has a cleft in it. And these different forms end up with a different physiology. So the determinants of the physiology and what we have to do is really dependent on these factors. So the size and type of septal defects. So whether there's just an atrial, uh, sorry, an atrial septal defect or just a ventricular septal defect, how much AV valve regurgitation there is. Obviously with more regurgitation, there's more symptoms and then other concomitant issues. Primarily, we find that kids end up keeping a PDA very commonly with uh, AV uh, canal defects. There also can be LV outflow tract obstruction, and this may not be present at birth or in the first few months of life, but can develop over a longer period of time. And if there's coarctation, obviously that changes a lot of uh, the physiology and a lot of what needs to be done. So first I wanted to talk about the physiology in partial AV canals. In this form, there's a primum atrial septal defect, and then there's a left AV valve cleft with varying amounts of regurgitation. This varying amounts of regurgitation can really change just how symptomatic these kids are. However, with just an atrial septal defect, these kids are often not symptomatic. So they are asymptomatic and take a long time before or a longer time before anything needs to be done. These are usually done in preschool age children. Uh, and Dr. Dable can talk about when he prefers to do them, but usually in the two to four years of age range, although sometimes these aren't identified until much later in life. On the opposite side of the spectrum is a complete AV canal. In a complete AV canal, there is a large VSD, which ends up driving the physiology. So yes, there is a primum ASD, and yes, there's a common AV valve with varying degrees of regurgitation, but it's really the VSD that drives the physiology. For these kids, they often need supportive treatment, and that's commonly in the form of diuretics and feeding uh, support. So diuretics, that can be done anywhere in the world, and we're talking about Lasix primarily, but also can be other diuretics um, as needed. And by feeding support, that's often by fortifying feeds is what we do uh, here in the States, and that has to be done with uh, giving formula, or that can be done with an NG tube um, if that's available. Or alternatively, we can even look at afterload reduction. While that's not a primary uh, um, method that we utilize, uh, if, uh, if at all possible, if you know that the child is very symptomatic despite optimizing diuretics and feeding, giving ACE inhibitors is a way to be able to uh, help them out and maybe decrease the amount of left to right shunt for the period of time you can wait until um, a surgery can be performed. So I talked about the far right and the far left. And in between, it's primarily driven by how large the VSD is. So if the VSD is going to be larger, then there'll be more shunting and more symptoms. If the VSD is smaller and there's primarily an atrial septal defect component, then those kids can often wait a longer time until they need to have surgery. A few echocardiographic images. 
And I'm sorry, that is not functioning optimally. So I'm going to share my uh, normal PowerPoint. So I think this will prevent the translation and I apologize for that. Um, but the videos are not working on the uploaded version. Here is a common atrioventricular canal defect with a large primum ASD. There looks to be an, a secundum ASD as well. A large common AV valve with uh, a large inlet VSD as well. It's important on these kids to really understand where the connections of the atrioventricular valve are on the septum. And as you can see here, there are connections that stay on the same side of the septum. The next image is a close up of that, of the crux of the heart to be able to see both the common AV valve, the large VSD and the large primum ASD. This kid, not surprisingly, had significant symptoms at two months of age. And then with diuretics and feeding assistance, went to four months of age before getting a complete repair. Other things to think about is how much regurgitation there is. And you can see here, there's a mild amount on the right side of the AV valve and then a small amount on the left AV valve as well in blue. I mentioned also about LV outflow tract obstruction. So the aortic valve in this disease is uh, not pulled in towards the AV valves. And so the aortic valve is farther away from the apex of the heart. And so you can see how you get LV outflow tract obstruction with a narrowed um, left ventricular outflow tract. This kid also had a left SVC as evidenced by the dilated coronary sinus. Additionally, it is important to note the papillary muscle structure. And in this kid, there are two normal sized papillary muscles, which is very important for the surgical planning. Here um, in a different child, this is a partial AV canal where you can see the large primum ASD as it plays through and then two separate AV valves. There does not appear to be a particular septal defect component for this child. I think one of the microphones is not. If Jenny could mute. Jenny, can you mute? Hola, ¿con quién hablo? Can you mute, Jenny? Con el cita. Dile ahorita a este a Gustavo. Se puede conectar. A la plataforma INCOR, porque si es, están celebrando el Día del Padre, están, son solo 50 más o menos personas de todas las dos. I don't know if papás. The... A ver si tiene opción acá, los tres papás de acá están participando y tienen bastante opción. A ver si él tiene suerte y también se gana algo. Mar Margaret, you guys can manually mute. Ya, dile, just... dile, dile, dile. Que se venga, si no. Ya, ya les pasé la voz. Yeah. I can try to speak over, uh, you know, in the interest of time. So this last thing that I wanted to show was on this child with a partial AV canal, there's a cleft in the anterior leaflet of the uh, left AV valve, uh, which is a common finding with the par partial AV canal. And from here, there can be regurgitation. 
Thank you. That's a brief overview of uh, some of the preoperative considerations um, in these children with AV canals. I'm sure there'll be questions and more time for discussion at the end. Uh, and so I will send it back to uh, Daphne and if she, and I'm sure operative considerations will be next. And thank you. I think we could do the questions at the end. I know Ken Remy has a question, but we can do that. Mm -hmm. so let Bob go next. So Bob, go right ahead. Okay, good. And it looks like my subtitles are going to work. Great. Well, thank you for this opportunity to present this afternoon. I'm going to spend the next 15 minutes talking about operative techniques in atrioventricular septal defect repair. I don't have any disclosures. So I've broken my talk into four parts. I'm going to briefly start with the history of surgery of atrioventricular septal defect repair. Then I'm gonna spend most of the time talking about the basics of the surgical technique. I'm gonna then move on to surgical tips. And then I'm gonna spend a very brief amount of time talking about surgical results. So any surgical talk has to have a little component of history in it. And so uh, the first repair of an atrioventricular septal defect was performed by Dr. Lillehei back in 1954. So it's a very old operation. Uh, that first repair was performed with cross circulation um, and unfortunately wasn't successful. And it was actually a primary repair of a complete atrioventricular septal defect. Uh, in 1958, Lev described the conduction system in babies with atrioventricular septal defects. And then it was 1962 when the first real technique for repair of an AVSD occurred, and that was by both Maloney and Garbodi. On uh, 1966, Dr. Rostelli's classification of AVSDs came out, and we'll very briefly touch on that. The two patch technique was described by Trussler in 1975. And from my standpoint, one of the most important developments was in 1999 uh, with the description of uh, the modified one patch technique by Drs. Wilcox and Dr. Nunn, also known as the Australian technique. The Rostelli classification, I don't think is super important to the surgical repair, but a lot of times um, my uh, colleagues in pediatric cardiology want to talk about it and discuss it. So I do briefly have a slide here about it. Uh, the vast majority of atrioventricular septal defects fall in the Rostelli A category, where there's a complete division of the superior bridging leaflet over the crest of the septum, which you can see here. Uh, type B is very rare in which they're straddling cords from either valve extending into the opposite ventricle. And then type C is listed on the far right here where you have an undivided superior bridging leaflet and there are no cordal attachments to the crest of the septum. And this type C is most commonly associated with tetralogy of Fallot and atrioventricular septal defect, so tet canal. So now we'll move on to surgical techniques and this is the majority of what I'm gonna focus on today. So. We'll talk briefly, uh, Dr. Agarwal nicely described the different types of atrioventricular septal defect, and there are certainly commonalities in terms of how you repair them. Uh, so we'll start with a partial atrioventricular septal defect, and really there are two components to surgical repair, and they're pictured uh, in, the, in the drawings to the right. So the cleft repair, it's important to completely close the cleft really for all types of atrioventricular septal defect, including uh, complete AVSDs and partials. Um, I would say the two exceptions to that are unbalanced right dominant canals, and then babies that have either a single papillary muscle or two very closely spaced papillary muscles, you might consider a partial cleft closure, but really all other patients should have a complete cleft closure. Um, and then the second part of the surgery is just closing the prima atrial septal defect. So obviously a partial is much simpler than the other types of AVSD. A transitional AVSD is kind of in the middle uh, of the two types in between partial and complete. And it really has the same two components for the second and third, but it also includes closure of the VSD. The VSD in a transitional AVSD is typically located kind of 
right at the top of where the cleft is. So again, this is the superior bridging leaflet. This is the inferior bridging leaflet. And then the VST, which you can't see very well, is kind of right here at the crux of the heart, right at the crest of the ventricular septum. And you do need to close that. And the good thing about a transitional AVSD is it lends itself particularly well to a modified one patch technique, which we're gonna talk about in more detail. So moving on to complete AVSD, uh, the original repair was a one patch technique. And I think this is a very difficult repair. And personally, I never do this in practice. Um, this is just a schematic drawing. And as you can see, there's a patch in the uh, atrial septum above. There's a patch in the, in the ventricular septum below. And it's actually the same patch. So just to detail it a little bit more, here's some individual drawings of the steps of the operation. So this is common to all AV canal repairs. The first step is to visualize the, the valve and then to figure out where the top of the cleft is. So in your mind, you have to divide the right side of the AV valve from the left side of the AV valve. And that's why this is such a difficult operation. So I've had the, um, opportunity to train a lot of junior partners. And this is really the last operation that I let them do. I let them do Norwood procedures before I let them do AVSDs because I think that it's a very challenging operation to kind of visualize in your mind. Um, but really the first step again is just to put a marking stitch at the top of the cleft uh, to know where the valve is going to come together. And then with a one patch technique, you have to divide the bridging leaflets. So here you see them dividing the right uh, the superior bridging leaflet into a right side and a left side. The inferior bridging leaflet has already been divided. Um, this technique is, you can use really with any of the three uh, techniques that I'm going to show you, but with a one patch technique, you have to do this. With the two patch and the modified one, you don't necessarily have to divide the bridging leaflets. I think that this increases the risk because when you divide the valve, there's really not much going back. And that's why I think a one patch technique is probably not the best technique to use. Um, and then you sew your patch in beginning in the ventricular septum. And then moving on, the patch basically ends up being sandwiched between the two sides of the uh, bridging leaflets, which have been divided. And then it's carried on and used to close the primum atrial septal defect. So again, it's one patch that's starting in the ventricular septum. It's bridging the gap between the, the uh, bridging leaflets. And then it's going out here to close the primum atrial septal defect. So again, it's a complicated technique. A simpler technique is the two patch technique, which is visualized here. And if you look at this schematic, it looks very similar to the one patch. The difference is, you have a different patch in the atrial septum than the patch you have in the ventricular septum, which I think makes it easier to uh, perform this technique. So once again, you start with the VSD. Um, it doesn't show you, well, the, the cleft stitch is the first, but this is the VSD stitch and they've done this um, because if you put the cleft stitch in, you wouldn't see this as well. But the stitches kind of go along the crest of the septum here, and then these will be passed through the patch. And in terms of patch material, there's a lot of flexibility about what you can use. But the stitches go through the crest of the septum, through the patch, and then you do a second row of stitches that go through the bottom of the patch, and then those are the stitches that will be passed up through the uh, bridging leaflets. And you can see that here a little bit. So the patch is here, and these stitches from the bottom edge of the patch have been passed up through uh, the bridging leaflet and then through the patch that's going to be used for the ASD repair. So again, you end up sandwiching just like you've done with the one patch technique, but I think that it's easier to visualize when you're not using the same patch to do both. Because with the one patch, you have to go back and forth on the two sides of the AV valve, and that's very complicated. This to me is a much simpler technique. And then this just shows testing the cleft repair. So you can see here, they put several stitches in the cleft, and they're just testing to make sure that the valve is competent. And this, this is the completed result. So here the patch has been sewn around to complete the closure of the primum atrial septal defect. And I want to draw your attention to this picture because it shows the coronary sinus. And as you can see, the coronary sinus has been left on the right side of the heart, which I think is the preferable way to repair a canal. Uh, in the uh, earlier days of AV canal repair, there were lots of surgeons who left the coronary sinus on the left side. 
but I think in 2021, the best way to repair is to leave it on the right side. And we'll talk about that a little bit more when we talk about our surgical tips. So the third technique and the one that I use for the vast majority of my AVSD repairs is a modified one patch technique or an Australian technique. And with this technique, you actually close the VSD primarily. So you still take pledgeted stitches that that go to the crest of the septum, but then they go straight through the AV valve to close the VSD. And I'll show you that with some more pictures. So here you can see that the stitches are going through the back there, through the crest of the septum, going through these bridging leaflets, the superior and inferior bridging leaflets, and then they're going through the pericardial patch, which is what's gonna be the primum ASD closure. And here's a, a side view of the same thing. So the stitches are going on the right side, the left bundle branch is here, so you never want to take a stitch all the way through the ventricular septum. You want your stitches to stay on the right side of the septum, and then it goes through the AV valve, which is pictured here, and then through the patch that you're going to use to, use the prim to close the primum. So there are lots of advantages and disadvantages to each of these techniques, and so I just want to briefly go through this. So a traditional one patch technique, as I mentioned, is the most complicated type of repair, and I really would not recommend it. Um, I saw some one patch repairs in uh, training, uh, but I have not done any since I've been in practice, and I haven't ever had a partner since I've been in practice that's used it. I think that this is the downfall. It's got the longest clamp times because it's very difficult to visualize this, and it just takes longer to complete. I think that for um, practical purposes, a two patch, if you want to use a patch in the VSD, a two patch is a better repair. Um, it has intermediate clamp times, so it takes a little bit less time than the traditional one patch, but it's not as short as the modified one patch. And I would say an advantage of the two patch technique is that it's applicable to all AVSDs. Um, the modified one patch technique in my eyes is the best technique. And it's what I again use for the vast majority of my repairs. And one of the main reasons that I use it is that it has the shortest clamp times. So I can do a repair. My clamp time for a modified one patch is probably 20 minutes or 25 minutes less than it would be for a two patch. And I think that that's an advantage, a significant advantage. And this is another thing uh, that I think is important. There's less resource utilization. So if you do a two patch, you have to have two patches. Whereas if you do a modified one patch technique, you use stitches to close the ventricular septum. So the VSD is closed with just stitches. And then you can use autologous pericardium to close the primum. And so I think that this is the most cost-effective way to repair an AVSD. And so I would highly recommend this. The people who uh, don't like a modified one-patch technique are those who say that it's not applicable to all patients with AVSDs. And some people say that if you have a very large VSD, that you should not use this technique. And I don't think that that's 100% true. There's not very clear data to say that a large VSD can't be closed with a modified one patch. I would say that a TET canal cannot be closed with a modified one patch. That's the one scenario where you have to use a two patch technique. But I think in general, even with a large VSD, a modified one patch can be used. And this last thing is important. When you're teaching somebody to do an AVSD, this is probably the most reproducible technique because I think it's the easiest to visualize. And so that's another reason why I think that this is probably the, the most preferable of the three techniques. So now I just wanna move on and quickly talk about some surgical tips. So in terms of timing of repair, it's clear that early repair is difficult. So neonatal repair of AVSD is not recommended. I think that there are some people who do it, but in general, the AV valve in a neonate is very flimsy. And I think that you're setting yourself up for AV valve problems if you try to do an AVSD repair in the neonatal period. And by that time, I would say probably less than two months of age. But you can't delay too long in the other direction because I think that volume overload ends up being a very significant issue. So volume overload can certainly over time exacerbate AV valve regurgitation. So if you don't repair, say, within the first six months of life, and that volume overload can definitely make your AV valve worse, and once the AV valve starts to leak, it becomes much more difficult to repair because when you test the valve, you can't get it to maintain competency to see where the leaflets oppose each other. So again, I think the ideal time to repair is probably somewhere between two to six months of age. And I would say we tend to do it probably more in the two to three month 
uh, range. I'll just briefly mention atrial fenestration. I think it really should only be reserved for complex patients and it's a complex topic. It's a controversial topic. Uh, patients with pulmonary hypertension though, probably deserve to have an atrial fenestration left at the time of repair. And then the other category of patients that you might consider fenestrating the atrial septum are those patients who have an unbalanced AVSD. And people do it in both directions. So people fenestrate for both right dominant and left dominant canals, obviously for different reasons. But I think that both of those circumstances, you might consider leaving an atrial fenestration. I think this last point is probably the most important of all the tips, and that is that you need to take the time with these cases. This is an operation where I probably spend the first five minutes of my clamp time just inspecting the valve, looking at the ventricular septal defect, and really understanding what the anatomy is. Because once you start putting stitches in, it's very difficult to undo what you've, what you've started. So I would take the time to really examine the valve, examine the VSD, and you also need to test the valve frequently. So you want to be squirting saline into the valve to see where the leaflet edges are going to oppose because that helps you to place the stitches uh, in the ideal location. What I would say is that I don't really cool that much these days. We rarely use a significant amount of hypothermia um, but I do think that this is a circumstance where if you think you're going to have a long cross clamp time, I would recommend mild hypothermia. So cooling to 28 degrees or cooling to 32 degrees can be a useful adjunct if you think that the repair is going to take a while. And then the last tip I think is also very useful. So sometimes when you look at the primum atrial septal defect and try to see the left side of the AV valve, it can be challenging. And a way to get around that to get better visualization is to actually open the entire atrial septum. So the vast majority of these kids will have a PFO or a small secundum ASD. And so I actually take a pair of scissors and stick it through the PFO and cut the bridge in between the primum and the secundum ASDs, and that gives you much better visualization. There's no risk of causing heart block by doing that, and it really helps make the repair easier. So I just want to spend a little bit of time talking about heart block because it's really one of the uh, major downfalls of this type of repair. Uh, the unfortunate thing is you really can get heart block with any type of AVSD, so you can get it just as easily with a partial versus a transitional versus a complete, and I don't really think that the type of repair technique that you use makes a big difference. So I don't think there's a higher incidence with a one patch versus a two patch versus a modified one patch. In these patients with atrial ventricular septal defects, the AV node is definitely more posterior and inferior uh, toward the coronary sinus. And you can see that in the picture here. It can't be in its usual location because the prime of ASD is in the, in the place where the AV node usually would be. And so it gets displaced a little more posteriorly and a little more inferiorly. In order to avoid the AV node, your VSD stitches should be away from the crest of the septum and you should take very shallow bites. So underneath this inferior bridging leaflet, I take my stitches much farther back. Underneath the superior bridging leaflet and really in the middle, you can take them right at the crest of the septum, but underneath the inferior bridging leaflet, I go much farther back away from the edge of the septum and I take very shallow bites over here. And then when I'm closing the primum atrial septal defect, I actually take my bites along the left AV valve. So as opposed to going in the atrium here, which you can see is very close to the AV node, which is pictured right there, I go right along the edge of the valve. And I don't think that affects the competency of the valve, but it definitely decreases your likelihood of causing heart block. And then as I mentioned before, I always leave the coronary sinus on the right side. I think that in 2021, we want a completely normal physiologic repair and leaving the coronary sinus on the right side maintains that, that normal physiology. So just a brief minute on surgical results. Uh, unfortunately, there really are no randomized control trials to compare the different results of techniques. Um, and so until that happens, I don't think anybody can really say that one technique is better than another technique. But again, in my practice, I feel like a modified one patch is really the best way to go.
Uh, if you look at the Society of Thoracic Surgeons database, which really includes most of the programs in the United States, and as well as some Canadian programs, the mortality for AV canal repair is just slightly above 3%, and it really has not changed over probably the last five to 10 years. So there is a significant mortality risk associated with this operation, much more than many of the simpler operations that we do in this age range. Uh, the risk of a pacemaker should probably be about 1% or slightly less. And then these kids certainly have some late risks of reoperation, the most common being for a left AV valve reops, and that probably is in the neighborhood of 10 to 20%. And then a smaller percentage of these kids will develop subaortic stenosis, and that percentage is probably less than 5%. So thank you very much for letting me share these operative techniques and I'll be happy to take questions after we hear from Maria. Thank you, Bob, that was a beautiful talk. Um, next will be Maria McAtee, who is speaking to us about um, nursing care and post-operative care and patients after an AV canal. She's an advanced nurse practitioner at um, Bob's institution, UAB. So go right ahead, thank you for joining us, Maria. Absolutely. Uh, can you guys see my screen? Yeah, looks great. All right, subtitles and all. <laughs> okay, well, I'm, I'm Maria McAtee. Um, a little background about myself. I began my career at Children's of Alabama 10 years ago as a new graduate nurse. Um, I have worked in the capacity as a pediatric nurse practitioner in a cardiac ICU um, at Duke Children's Hospital, but then returned to Alabama in 2018 in my current role as a nurse educator. Um, so today I wanted to talk to you guys about a couple of the efforts that have evolved over uh, the years with the goal of providing increased situational awareness in the CDICU, um, and we'll make it specific to the post-operative recovery of the AV canal repair. A little bit about our center. Um, we are a 20 bed uh, CVICU and I would say we stay at about 70% um, occupancy. Um, summertime certainly drives up our uh, our patient volume and summertime also brings us an influx of new graduate nurses. Um, so our May nursing graduates uh, come to us excited to start their nursing career. Um, you can see that most of our staff uh, does in fact have less than about two years of nursing experience. Um, and as we know, um, nursing experience is invaluable and so, so coveted. Um, but until we can really grow our pool of more senior staff, um, it's our job to ensure that we are ensuring clinical competence at the bedside. So we need our nursing staff able to recognize subtle changes in, uh, in, in their patient. We need them to be able to communicate their concerns effectively and ultimately to intervene appropriately. So listed here are four common complications of an AV canal repair. Um, all of these are discussed in great detail at the onset of hire in um, new graduate orientation classes. Um, so we go into the details of AV valve regurgitation and management of that. We talk about different arrhythmias. Um, we speak about pulmonary hypertension crises and how that causes low cardiac output. And of course, how to treat, um, how we manage postoperative bleeding at the bedside. And while this didactic information is great, um, it gives a solid foundation. We know that true comprehension of these um, clinical scenarios really aren't truly understood until they're placed um, in that environment at the bedside. So I'm going to talk about a couple of just simple interventions that um, our unit has implemented to really um, create that that scene of situational awareness. So AV valve regurgitation, protection of the AV valve is essential in the immediate post-operative period. Um, so clear expectations from our physicians and nurse practitioners aids our nurses in optimizing hemodynamics. So um, ensuring our CVP isn't too high, uh, ensuring afterload is appropriate. Um, all of this is set with uh, strict hemodynamic limits, um, as most institutions would have. So a set limit is when, uh, if we're outside of that range, a nurse would immediately notify a physician or a nurse practitioner and seek out interventions. But what we also encourage is use of hemodynamic goals. Um, this is an opportunity that allows nurses to work within their scope, troubleshoot a patient condition, 
um, while also having to set limits to encourage patient safety. Uh, we also utilize um, as a team graphical trends at the bedside. Um, a visual is so helpful in um, calling our attention to subtle changes in a patient's vital signs. Um, and for our nursing staff specifically, having that visual as opposed to a tabular trend um, can really encourage them to make a uh, notification to a provider much more confidently. I think our younger staff can second guess themselves, um, second guess what they're seeing, feeling, touching at the bedside. Um, so having that visual uh, really supports them in, in the process of notification. Uh, we expect a heart block or junctional ectopic tachycardia um, in the postoperative period. Um, so we anticipate potentially pacing if necessary. Um, a couple of things about pacing. I feel like it's a very intimidating procedure for our nursing staff, young and old. Um, they, I think there's a fear associated with um, malfunction or the potential to misprogram these devices. So um, we came up with a couple of uh, simple interventions just to really decrease the amount of variation and um, real-time thinking that goes into uh, programming these devices. So the first is a pacemaker card. This is a piece of paper that arrives to the bedside for any patient who um, may require temporary uh, epicardial pacing. On the card, you will find settings that our EP physician has uh, selected that would be safe for any pediatric patient, uh, keeping in mind that an appropriate lower rate would uh, need to be set. Uh, for that patient's age. So in the event of an emergency, the settings are there, uh, ready to be programmed. And um, once the dust settles and parameters can be more specified to each individual patient, they can be written right there um, on the card. So it's a great communication tool from nurse to nurse, in addition to um, nurse to physician communication. Everybody is on the same page as what we're doing with that pacemaker for that patient. Other instructions, which I know it's kind of small and hard to see, is um, reminders to check um, output threshold. Um, so the Instructions are there for how we uh, test our threshold. And then there's spaces on the card to document what the output threshold is and where the stimulation or output is set for that particular patient. Um, so again, great communication to have uh, between the teams so everybody's on the same page. And to the right is just a visual of how we standardize um, preparation to pace. So as we all know, in an emergency, what normally takes us, you know, 30 seconds to do is going to take us or what it feels like 15 minutes <laughs> to accomplish the same task when we're, we're rushed for time. Um, so in an effort to to speed things up and make things safer for our patients and easier for our staff, uh, we just have all of our patients who may be at at risk for arrhythmias um, have their pacing wires already inserted into the appropriate cables. Um, our, we have a lot of equipment associated with our pacemakers, so we go ahead and get everything attached so that in the event of an emergency, turn on the pacemaker, set a lower rate, and ensure that our connections are secure and we're ready to go. Um, so, so doing this does provide a little bit more comfort um, for the intervention of pacing. Preoperatively, um, we know that our AV canals are subjected to pulmonary overcirculation, and they will have alterations in their pulmonary vasculature. Um, so in the classroom with our nursing staff, we teach that pulmonary hypertension is very deadly. Um, and as a unit, we work really hard to identify patients um, who are high risk to prevent this physiology from occurring. Um, so below, you can see a copy of our bedside cardiac arrest prevention tool. Um, and this really serves to prevent um, a pulmonary hypertensive crisis from occurring at the bedside. Um, it lists preventative measures. Um, and I'll review a little bit more in detail this box for crucial first steps uh, that would take place at the bedside um, if the patient were in a dangerous, um, had hit a dangerous threshold. So RAP is called our, RAP is 
um, our resuscitation action plan, or really our cardiac arrest prevention bundle. Um, below is a table that helps us identify which patients would benefit most from this bundle. So this could be any patient that had a previous cardiac arrest or in the postoperative period, if we're receiving patients on um, high inotropic or vasoactive support. Um, calling our attention to number six, uh, for pulmonary hypertension, if a patient has severe lung disease, we would define that as um, patients on robust ventilator support. So um, elevated pressures, 100% FiO2, or having requirements of nitric oxide. So that is certainly a patient that we would think would be high risk for a pulmonary hypertensive crisis and low cardiac output syndrome. So we would go ahead and enroll them on our bundle. So, um, our bundle consists of four different elements. Um, the first one is one that I think is one of the most valuable, which is our safety huddle. Um, originally, when RAP was developed, our focus was on supporting staff to rescue patients. And the crucial first steps um, that we would discuss were the quality of CPR, making sure we had a backboard, um, you know, onset of CPR, minimizing the amount of time it took us to start chest compressions. And what we found is we got really good at running codes, um, really good at saving patients, but we really needed to redirect our attention towards the prevention. Um, so the RAP safety huddle is an opportunity for a physician to review a little bit of physiology um, and put it into context of this specific patient and how we can truly prevent an arrest from occurring. Um, so with that, patient-specific vital signs are discussed, very clear expectations are set so that everybody is on the same page. Um, there's also pertinent to pulmonary hypertension is a discussion of pre-sedation. Um, and that would get into um, pre-sedating before suctioning, nursing care, um, et cetera. Um, and lastly, uh, a very important element is the availability of uh, emergency medications at the bedside. Um, we now have a diluted epinephrine syringe available at the bedside of any patient uh, who is enrolled on RAP. So the dose of which is discussed in the safety huddle and is written on the RAP sheet so the nurse knows exactly how much of this diluted epinephrine she should give if a certain threshold is met. Um, the availability of this drug and being able to get it to our patients quickly um, anecdotally has certainly reduced the need for chest compressions in several um, uh, patient scenarios out on the unit. Um, and if you look over here to this graphic, this shows the, the crucial first steps that are discussed in the safety huddle. So if a SAT reaches a certain threshold, the end title disappears, heart rate drops to a specified level um, with the CVP increasing, you know, all signs of pulmonary hypertensive crises, uh, the nurse would immediately, you know, press her button to get some help, um, cycle a blood pressure cuff to, to check, a, check a cuff against an art line. And then she or he could go ahead and give this what we call green epi, but this diluted um, epinephrine. Um, a physician does not have to be at the bedside for this. Um, so it's a way of getting interventions, rescuing these patients um, sooner. Uh, back to our AV Canal post-op patient, I, I wanted to give you an example of a high yield safety huddle. And I believe that is one that includes a, a brief physiology review as well as the interventions that treat it. So I think the more interactive these huddles are, um, the higher the yield in terms of developing the critical thinking skills for our younger staff. So just a brief discussion of you know, what causes rises in PVR, um, how agitation, hypoxia, noxious stimuli, acidosis, all of those things um, can induce a, a pulmonary hypertensive crises. And so this is why we are going to pre-medicate uh, with sedation or a paralytic before you go to bathe, weigh, stick, um, change a dressing on this patient. Um, additionally, there may be a discussion about this is not a patient we want to break the ventilator circuit. Um, maybe we want to wait a little bit before we break the circuit to suction um, or potentially use inline suctioning. So again, the more interactive, uh, the greater the yield and the greater the level of situational awareness at the bedside. 
Uh, this slide is actually one that I took from one of our training um, PowerPoints. It seems to be effective in helping our staff relate um, how significantly small the volume is, the total blood volume is for our um, neonates and infants. Um, and so with that being said, when it comes to post-operative bleeding, uh, we check our output of chest tubes every 15 minutes um, because we feel like we can't wait a full hour for fear that uh, these small patients may have already less lost, um, you know, a quarter to half of their total blood volume if they do have significant postoperative bleeding. Dr. Dable is fantastic, um, but this is how we prepare, prepare for the worst. Um, so chest tube output is measured immediately and then at 15 minute intervals. So the intervals are then multiplied by our nursing staff by four to estimate that hourly bleeding rate. Um, and then that total is adjusted for weight. So chest tube measurement um, continues at these frequent intervals. Um, so long as the total chest tube output is five milliliters per kilo per hour. Um, and so that can be pretty time intensive. It, it sometimes takes one person uh, to really be designated to um, checking chest tube output. Um, so the important piece of this is if there is significant postoperative bleeding, and this can be physician dependent um, related to how we replace um, the total uh, estimated hourly losses. Um, so that could be anywhere between five to 10 milliliters per kilo per hour for when we would start replacing. So the way we do this is replace or is, is replacement with three different blood products running um, at the same time. Um, so we'll take the estimated hourly loss and provide 50% of that with packed red blood cells, 25% of that with platelets and the remaining 25% with FFP. So this is a example of what our nurses would be doing at the bedside. Um, check their chest tube output. Maybe they note that there was uh, 13 milliliters present. It's a five kilo patient. Um, so then they would take that 13 mLs or 12 and a half mLs uh, for their to program for their platelets, um, their FFP, and then doubling that number um, to program their pumps for the, the packed red blood cells. So um, this is something our nurses really take, uh, take ownership of and just kind of relay um, relay what the bleeding is to our surgeons and intensivists um, during the post-operative period. And that's all I have. Um, this is my last slide. So situational awareness, it's important. We, we know it's when we don't prepare for the worst um, that we wish we really would have. And we're really lucky to have some physicians uh, who recognize the benefits of supporting enhancing situational awareness with our nurses at the bedside. So thank you. Thank you, Maria. That was fantastic. Um, and all three speakers did such a great job. And I think we, we certainly have some time for questions. Um, the, just to go back to Ken Remy's question, he was a little more complicated than the simple transitional and complete AV canal. And she's talking about looking at um, unbalanced AV canals that do occur, certainly. And how do you assess what's unbalanced, degree of unbalance, and what kind of measures you can do to balance them back. So Manisha, well, how do you think about an unbalanced canal? So um, I think it's a little bit uh, institution specific. Uh, out of one institution, they've published two papers on how to decide how much of the valve needs to be over each ventricle in different ways of quantifying that. Uh, and then if you talk to them now, they actually just use more of a feel approach to decide whether there's enough valve over each of the ventricles. Uh, I think it takes a little bit of um, measurements. So if you um, look at that four chamber view and looking at how much blood flow goes to each ventricle, uh, that becomes important. And I actually wonder if I, So now you can actually uh, see my translations uh, or subtitles, but the idea is to make sure there's enough AV valve over both ventricles. 
And realistically, more importantly, is that there's enough AV valve over the left ventricle. With right dominant AV canals being much more common, really noting that you have enough both AV valve and left ventricle to give a competent systemic outflow. There's different ways of dealing with insufficient right AV valve uh, tissue. I don't know if, uh, Bob, if you have other thoughts about it uh, or other ways that you think about it as well. No, I agree. I mean, I think that the standard is looking at the proportion of the valve that's committed to the ventricle versus the overall size of the valve. And I mean, I think that the challenge is when you're in the gray zone. I think that if there's very significant imbalance, it's usually pretty obvious and you don't really need those calculations to tell you. What I would also say is if I had to choose, I would obviously always choose a left dominant canal because I think that you can usually get away with having a pretty small right ventricle um, and not have problems postoperatively. So it's really the canals that, as you mentioned, are right dominant that are harder to deal with. Um, but I don't think that there are clear cut guidelines about what you can, what you should do. Um, I, I would say that the Congenital Heart Surgeon Society is trying to sort this whole issue out. We have, um, it's one of, I guess it's our second to most recent cohort that we've started. Um, and there are a large number of patients that are enrolled. And I think that unfortunately it's too early in the experience to really get much out of that data. Um, but I hope that over the coming years, we'll, we'll learn more from that experience because it is a large co cohort, uh, a large national cohort of patients that have been enrolled. Thanks. Um, we have a question, you know, you were showing the, um, the, 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 um, the, the growth and maturation of your nursing staff. And you start with nurses that are quite um, green. And I was wondering, like, how do you decide what patients they'll take care of? How do you staff that when you talk about a patient coming through? Who makes that decision? Just sort of processing, um, making sure everybody's doing their best job. And their yeah, best absolutely. Um, uh, so the approach that we take, um, I know there's some, some centers that uh, provide like a, a tiered orientation where nurses will come and orient to um, like a lower acuity assignment. Um, then work and then come back on orientation and then train to the next level. Um, we would love to, that's, that's a goal I think that we're working towards. Um, but for now, the, the method that we take is they have a really long orientation. It's about 20 weeks. Um, but we do start all of our nurses training um, in our cardiac step down unit uh, to give them a solid baseline for those basic fundamentals. Um, and then along their training, um, we tell them once they come off of orientation, they're, they're not going to be taking our sickest of the sick, but we want to make sure that they are prepared should their lower acuity assignments um, suddenly take a, a turn um, in that direction. So our charge nurses do a phenomenal job. Um, they really use a synergistic model. Um, you know, the, the needs of the patient with the skills of the nurse. Um, and specifically, our, our night shift nurses do a great job of really growing, um, growing staff um, from that, you know, novice nurse uh, to more experienced. Uh, a lot of times, if, if staffing will allow, uh, we'll pull a nurse from you know, being counted in staffing and let her have like an, an education shift with a more seasoned nurse um, when she's more prepared to, to handle, um, you know, one of our, our sicker post-operative admissions. So that's kind of our informal way of tiering orientation. It really depends on uh, how much staff um, we have available, but if given the opportunity, once somebody's been working for six months to a year and maybe ready to reorient to a higher acuity assignment. Hey, Maria, tell them about the, our nurse educators. Oh, yes. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Dable. So one thing that we added um, two years ago, I think in 2018, was um, clinical coaches. We, we originally called them our clinical leaders, but we've, we've changed the terminology to clinical coaches. They are an extension of our um, educator, of, of me as an educator and my partner, Chelsea, who uh, works with me with like a lot of the didactic onboarding, scheduling, that kind of thing. Um, 
uh, Katie and Josh, our clinical coaches, they're much more clinical. Uh, they're at the bedside and they don't take patients, they take nurses. Um, so they're there to check in with um, our young nursing staff, um, make sure that they understand what their patient's defect is, what the potential complications could be, essentially having some like mini safety huddles um, between the clinical coach and the nurse. And that's been fabulous. Um, it gets hard to kind of keep up and check in on everybody, but uh, they are there in real time for a 12 hour shift um, to really promote the continued learning critical thinking skills that happen um, at the bedside. Thanks, Mary. There's another question for you. Um, Lori is wondering what medications do you use for pre-sedation for noxious stimuli? Yes, um, typically a uh, rocuronium or fentanyl. Um, those are medications that we, with a fentanyl, we can't necessarily have uh, at the bedside, but we can have rocuronium um, drawn up and ready to give. Do we have any other questions from our, our participants? Well, if not, I'd like to say hello to everybody. It's nice to see everybody's names, if not all their faces. I'm so glad that you continue to join these, 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 these conferences. And I know that we're going to continue them. Our next one is going to be in the fall. We're going to take a little break in the summer for everybody to enjoy their time off, hopefully. And we're going to see you back in September. Anything you'd like to say, Margaret? Is there any updates on HCI? Um, no, I don't have a lot to say. I, I'm very excited about the fall schedule. Um, uh, Heart Care International's founder, Dr. Robert Mitchler, will be presenting in October. So that's an exciting piece to look forward to. And we will send more information and we're starting to teleconference with each of our locations. Mm -hmm. So you will see us before the fall when we get to do this all together, but we're excited with what we'll get to do together then. Let me just translate this to the rest of the team. Oh. <laughs> Este, esta es nuestra última charla por, por este verano. Este, hasta septiembre, regresamos en septiembre con más charlas. En octubre va a estar el doctor Mitchler, va a presentar. En septiembre comenzaremos y en noviembre te, estamos bien. En um, uh, octubre. Esperando la, la, que el doctor Juan León, el doctor Sergio, uh, van a presentar un caso que hicimos, un trumpet que hicimos en mm -hmm. Chiapas hace dos años. Así que nos vemos todos en septiembre, pero queremos eh, dejarles saber que estamos dispuestos. Si hay algún problema o alguna pregunta o cualquier caso que quieran, saben que me pueden contactar a mí y yo contacto a la doctora Su y a los cirujanos y a todos los demás. Uh, médicos del equipo. Muchas gracias por, por estar con nosotros y le agradecemos. Así que nos veremos en septiembre. Betsy Jr. was raising her hand, so Betsy. I think she signed off already. Oh, she did. Okay. Thank you. Okay, okay thanks a lot. So much. Bye. Muchas gracias. Bye. Buenas noches. Bye. 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 Bye.